We're going to kick this off with Mr. Jay Healy, who is a member of the DEF CON paper um, approval team, uh, and he is going to talk about some kind of big picture stuff. I think this is going to be a really, really interesting talk. Yes, sir? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over to, oh, number two, who has something. Will you introduce the speaker? So introduced. This is Jay. Go ahead, Jay. Crowd. Jay. Yay! All right. Um, so uh, I'm hoping this talk isn't going to be as laggy as that video was, but you can't. So, well, good. Well, come. Uh, <laughs> thanks for getting the joke. <clears throat> okay, so raise your hand if you're a first time speaker at DEF CON. Hey, we have a winner! We have a little tradition here at DEF CON, first time speakers must do a shot on stage. Congratulations. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Good luck. And if you want to know how to become be a first time speaker and be on the CFP review board, the answer is no, the dark tangent. So, um, this is a different kind of talk for DEF CON, and frankly, this is a different track for DEF CON. So, yes, this is the party room and this is the party track. But, last, yeah, woo! New track. Um, but, the DT wanted something different a new set of themes introduced to DEF CON. And if you came last year, if you read what he wrote in the program, it's, it's not going to be a surprise or what he wrote in this year's program. Last year, um, the Dark Tangent wrote in the program about how offense is overwhelming defense. Um, and he mentioned in this year is how that's leading to a sense of helplessness. And the dark tangent and others have said we can't just submit ourselves to this helplessness. We all need to be part of the solution. And so when he's saying hack with us, he's not just saying take out your computers and go have fun. He's saying we all need to own part of this solution. And so a lot of the talks that you're seeing in track one have to do with that, how we can get our legs behind responsibility or at, least, or at least reasonableness to make things better because they're not. And that's what this talk is going to be about. So, and the reason that he asked me to do this talk and to be part of the CFP review board is there are all sorts of great efforts that are happening in this. Um, mine happens to be, I work for a DC think tank, we tend to do national security issues. So a lot of the other talks you're going to see here may be from I Am the Cavalry or the EFF, and they have their own lanes in this. Um, ours is to really look at the national security lane um, and look at this at big picture. So I've been part of the community, first came to DEF CON 9, uh, was uh, military signals intelligence, did, did some offense but mostly defense, when uh, created the first military uh, joint cyber war fighting unit in 1998 ran, uh, set up the CERT at one of the, uh, one of the big investment banks, went on to the White House and was a director of cyber policy um, for the president giving advice on these issues. Um, and now I'm at a think tank so we get to think and write on these issues. So um, this isn't a hacker movie but I wanted to start out with, one, uh, with, um, with this great scene from the movie. So who knows uh, which movie is this from? Okay. Um, uh, Yes, that's from Zoolander. And so what's happening here? Gas it's Gas Fight. All right, I heard Gas Fight. Who said it over here? For, all right, Green. All right, come on, come on up, Green. You get a free book. Um, so this is my book. It came out last year. It's a, military, it's a history of cyber conflict. It's kind of like a military history of cyberspace. Um, so yeah, this is the Gas Fight scene in Zoolander. And I wanted to lead off with this um, mostly because I wanted you guys to be interested in what's, what's, what could be cool, you know. Gas fights are cool. And so, so, what happens, so what happens in the gas fight scene? Go 
Yeah, so these more these moron male models, right? Um, my my former colleagues, but um, so they're driving in this convertible and they decide it's just going to be so much fun splashing one another with gasoline, and uh, and they're hosing all each other down, and it's funny because you know you don't play with gasoline, and you know where this is going to end up, you know this is going to end up. <laughs> really freaking badly. And of course, a couple minutes into the scene, one of them takes out glamorously his cigarette, to boom, and the whole thing blows up. And you know it's funny because you know what's coming. And what bothers me so much about where we're in this field right now is that all of us know, in this room, at Black Hat before this, in Washington, D.C., at Fort Meade, with Cyber Command and NSA, in Moscow, in Beijing, I think we all know that we're playing with gasoline. That we all know that we are just coating ourselves in gas. And it's not funny, because we know what's going to happen. From, from the research that we did from this book, I can't find any real proof that anybody's died yet from an online attack. But we know it's coming. And worse, a lot of the people that are busiest spraying with gasoline are the ones that are saying, watch out, because this is going to be dangerous. General Alexander, the Cyber Command folks, all go, and it was funny when the models did it, because they were just going to blow themselves up. But the world is relying on this stuff that we've built, on this internet, on cyberspace. And so the models aren't, you know, the folks involved in the gas fight aren't just burning themselves, they're going to burn all of us. And what I think is very much missed when I, when I talk in Washington, D.C., so it's kind of our job to go around and talk to these Washington, D.C. policymakers, you know, Pentagon, you know, up at, up at Fort Meade, White House, is the debate is all about cyber this, cyber that, cyber the other thing. And I always have to remind folks, the internet is the most transformative thing that's come out of human brains for 650 years, since Gutenberg invented the printing press. All right, I'll grant you electrical power is pretty cool too, but okay, we'll give the internet top, top two or three, right? The, the most transformative, innovative technology that we as a human race, all of us together, have done. Because of the printing press, we gave, it gave us the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and all of the ideals, the, you know, the real scientific method, the Declaration of Independence, all of this wonderful art and science and rationality that came out of that. But imagine if 20 years after Gutenberg invented the printing press, it turns out the Pope, the petty princes of Europe, pretty much anybody that cared could know exactly what was being printed exactly who was printing it, and exactly who they were passing it to. Of course we can say that that violates privacy, and it's against civil liberties, and we can argue whether it's legal or constitutional, and people will, but I think that might be missing a larger point. If you couldn't rely on that underlying communications mechanism, you probably don't get the Renaissance, and you probably don't get the Enlightenment. You've changed the trajectory of humanity, not for five years or 50 years, but for 500. And probably even you've changed the trajectory for your humanity from then for every generation that there are humans in the universe. So we know how important the internet is. We know the threats that it's facing. And so what I want to try and get across in this talk, and we hope to get together, bring across in this track, is maybe these threats are more existential than we think. That maybe privacy isn't the main thing at risk here. So of course we can argue that we've been pushing too far for national security and spying and, and the, the cult of the offense and that's outweighing privacy and civil liberties. Um, and by the way, who's a Douglas Adams fan? What's, that, what's SEP mean? All right, now you got it first, book. Um, yeah, so 
I'll sign it afterwards. The, um, yeah, that's someone else's problem for me. I mean, in DC, I, I say I don't care about privacy and liber civil liberties, and of course I do, but I know Jennifer Granick has that. You know, I know <laughs> EFF, ACLU, there's a lot of folks that are going to worry about that. that. Others have that voice. So part of my job in DC is to say maybe we're making trade offs for today's national security at the risk of our digital economy, our digital future, and these future trajectories. Because I can't, I can't walk into a four star general or to the White House and go in and talk about privacy or civil liberties. It's seen as muling. You've got generals in, the, in a, a militarized cyber power, which I came from, right? I'm, I'm an insider to this. Um, and if you go into these hardcore trying to protect America from terrorists, you're, gonna, you're not going to win that by talking about privacy and civil liberties. If you say it's stupid national security policy and here's why, you might have a better case. The argument that I'm trying to warm them up for is that we're making trade-offs between today's security and the internet as a whole and in fact our trade-offs now between security and the future possibilities until the end of humankind. And so I try and hit them with the punchline is that when I hear in Washington DC folks say, well, why should we stop? Nobody else is going to stop. And when I say, well, maybe the future is going to look very different and they say, no, 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 it's going to be fine. And how do we know that? Because how do we trade, how do we make these trade-offs? Whether it's in this community with security researchers and hackers and the rest, in the Washington DC policy community, everywhere in between in all the other capitals to say how can we make these trade-offs for better security now so that we're not going to miss out on future renaissances and enlightenments if, we, if all of us keep pissing in the pool. So when I say saving cyberspace, People say, well, saving from what? And uh, it's great when you do history because it gives you all of these slides that other people, you know, other, other thoughts have, have come up with. And there's a slide from 1997, um, a Defense Science Board. And I love this because this is still kind of if you go to a threat talk, people are going to be doing this, this range. You know, you've got, you've got evil hackers. Um, who you know you're going to hit but low potential damage and all the way up to state sponsored. And not that much has changed since 1997. <laughs> Except maybe the um, who we see is state sponsored. And by the way, for the you young ones, that is in fact Saddam Hussein in the upper left. You, some of you, if, if uh, DC 21 was your first one, you might not remember that guy. Um, but also when we're, when I'm trying to talk about saving space, it's not just about those kinds of threats. Um, if, if some of you went to, to Black Hat and heard um, Jeff Moss kick off at, um, at Black Hat, he asked the group and he said, how many people think we're going to keep adding complexity to the system? And pretty much everyone raised their hands and, he, and then he asked, how many, how many silly chuckleheads think that um, that there's going to be some limit to complexity. And I think I was the only one that raised my hand. Because he was asking, do you think we'll just legislate or regulate so that we don't keep adding complexity? And um, I think, you know, I was in the finance sector. I know from 2008 that if you keep adding complexity to the system and you don't understand it, it can all come crashing down. And um, what we might end up with, a future that looks very different. So one of the things that I want to leave this audience with is be thinking about those discontinuities. That the future might look very, very different for good or for ill. And Dan Gear, who's one of my favorite folks, um, he passes gas and my IQ goes up by like five points. <laughs> he, um, he has this quote on the left which I really love. As society becomes more technologic, even the mundane comes to depend on distant digital perfection. So at the, thing about it, the same time where we're connecting everything to the internet is exactly the moment in time when we're most worried about the offense running away. And so we need to be thinking about those longer trends. One of my favorite quotes when I did the book, which by the way, I think they have in the bookstore called The Fierce Domain, fine, um, is this one. Few if any contemporary security controls can stop a dedicated red team. 
we know that, you're going to be hearing that all the time, we've been hearing that um, everywhere. This quote is from 1979. A guy named Lieutenant Colonel Roger Shell, United States Air Force, he was the father of the rainbow series of manuals, you know, the red book, the orange book, the blue book. 1979. So what he was essentially saying is the attacker has had the advantage, the offense has had the advantage over the defense since 1979 since before DEF CON, since before there was really an internet, certainly before web. Which means that if you do defense, if you're a computer security guy, what the fuck are we doing? Right? It means when I'm, when I'm a glass half empty, I say nothing I've done has mattered. The billions that we've spent, all of the patents that we've done, all the volumes you guys have discovered, is wasted. Now when I'm glass half full, I say no, at least we're keeping some kind of stasis. You know, I mean, the attackers are better, but at least they haven't run away with the field yet. In biology they call this the red queen effect from, from Alice in Wonderland. You have to keep running faster just to stay in place. But how long can a system stay in balance, year after year, decade after decade? with one side having a persistent and gain and, and growing advantage and that system can stay in balance. At some point you have to start thinking that this can change. So look, I'm, I'm a military guy, I learned a lot of military history and it doesn't have to stay that way, right? That one side has the advantage. All the time in human conflict, since we first started to pick up stone and stick against each other, the balance between offense and defense changes all of the time. Except maybe nuclear, except nuclear and maybe space. You know, right, Napoleonic cavalry and the offense would have the advantage till they met mass rifle fire and machine guns and then that got blitzkrieged and it goes back and forth all the time. So we can imagine that this can change. We can imagine that we can flip this so that the defenders have the advantage. So I mean, where there is good news. We know that security is getting better. We know that there are some places that we are starting to make a difference. Unfortunately, we also know that the bad guys are running away with the field. And again, I love this Dan Gear quote. You know, we're racking up personal bests, but the bad guys are setting world records. But maybe it's not just a simple straight line that the bad guys are getting better than us. Maybe they're getting better exponentially than we are. And I've heard some people make that case. So where do we hit that tipping point? When there's more predators than prey. Especially when it turns out governments seem to be busier trying to be the most efficient and voracious predators rather than protecting the rest of us from being prey. So we hear a lot of moaning in Washington DC nowadays about how it's a wild west. But the wild west isn't the worst of things. Frankly, I think the government likes that it's a wild west because they've got the best posse. Things worse than wild west. Um, right now it's the, the attackers have the advantage but you can imagine a place where the attackers have supremacy and every time you try and put up a server online, every time a company tries to put up an online strategy, an e-commerce strategy, there's always some asshole with an AK-47 or with a machine gun on the back of a pickup truck that rolls by. It might not just be Wild West, it might be Somalia. A stable state where every time we try and get our act together, we get dragged down. So when I get asked for saving, I also come in and saving for whom? Because when we talk about security, there's no time horizon to it, right? Most of us do incident response or our time horizon is how the hell am I going to get the server back online? How am I going to do these forensics? You know, I mean, we live on a timeline of, of, you know, at best a couple hours, a couple days, a couple of weeks ahead. But I'm trying, especially in DC, to try and say, no, we need a sustainable cyberspace, internet. We need to make sure that it's not going to just be there for us in 2014, but if we want our kids and grandkids and their grandkids to have a free internet, an open internet, a resilient internet, an awesome internet, we need to start thinking down. So that fits in the stuff I'm talking about, that fits in the things of the privacy, that fits in with I am the cavalry. There's a lot of good efforts to try and add that time horizon. Because when I think for our parents' generation or our 
grandparents' generation, or some of you in the back, maybe your great grandparents' generation, they thought the natural direction of technology was that we were going to be having jetpacks, we were going to be doing vacations on the moon or Mars. Because why wouldn't we? That's the natural direction that the technology is taking us. So, of course, we are going to have those things in a couple of decades. And it reminds me of e voting. In the mid 90s, there were a lot of folks that said, oh, electronic voting, internet voting, that's going to happen. It's going to give us a new, richer democracy. Where is it? There's all these possibilities, all these technical possibilities that we're not going to get because we can't secure it. Smart grid, Internet of Things,、um, there's so much of this that we can unlock embedded medical devices, driverless cars. If we don't unlock the security component, and I'm afraid we're going to look back at DC 42, and we're going to look back 20 years, and we're going to say, man, can you, can you imagine that we thought we were going to have those cars? Good thing we chopped them up and we, we, we proved how insecure they were, and we'll never have gotten those. Or whatever technology it is you like, if you don't care about driverless cars. You know, we're not going to get these re- renaissances and enlightenments that we could unlock with these technologies. So, when it comes to solutions, to me, the only vision, if you care about the future of the internet, is to flip this around, to get defense better than offense, so that we've got the commanding heights and the assholes have the harder job. What we really want is to get D double crocodiles O. You know, the defense isn't just better, it's superior, and we've got the supremacy. So, I'll, go, I'll talk about how I'm helping in, in some of my programs, but first I want to talk about how you guys might be able to hope, help. First, you've got to believe that it's possible. In Washington, D.C., I come across very few people that think that the defense can ever get better than the offense. They've given up hope. And the DT wrote, In this year's program, if we accept defense is futile because offense always wins, then we all stop trying as hard. And I can see this very much in Washington, D.C. If we don't think that defense can get better, then there's no reason for us to restrain our own offense. We might as well be the biggest, baddest player in government because everybody else is going to do and we've got nothing to lose. So, you have to care and, and think that you've got something that can contribute to this, and especially joining your time, your brain, your patience. And I'll talk about each one of those.、Um, your time, there's so many great groups that are out there, whether that's EFF, whether that's I Am the Cavalry, that's trying to get out and saying, We as security researchers haven't done everything, you know, we can't just keep releasing this stuff. Knowing that it's not going to get fixed correctly, we have to start feeling some ownership over the results. And the DT talks about that in this year's program also. Or dedicating your time to so many of the great volunteer efforts. You know, join Jericho and the open source vulnerability database, join so many other open source efforts.、Um, you know, we might not have had to go through Heartbleed if we would have had more time, volunteers, money involved. And a lot of the open source projects that are out there. The world is pretty much depending on us to get this stuff straight, and we have to feel some ownership for that.、Um, patience, especially if you're a vulnerable re- researcher. We know the first time you go to a company and say, I found a vuln, they might just brush you off. Have some patience with them.、Um, and we need to try and keep, we need to. Have some patience, even when people don't understand what it is that we're trying to do. Last is always trying to measure. I come across this with security researchers a lot. Folks that say we need Washington, D.C. to understand the importance of what we do so that they don't criminalize the kinds of things that we do.、Um, there's a great panel at Black Hat of saying if you see something, say something, should apply to our field too. And we shouldn't run into the CFAA and other laws. But the stuff that we're doing really matters. Or you that's doing is vuln researchers. So, to me, when I say, how do you know as a security researcher community that you're making a positive difference? That you're helping the defense more than you're helping the offense? 
and I get anecdotes. Oh, well, there is this one time, and I knew this guy. And the, the role of importance that we're having in society and the digital future and what we're all trying to build together, we need to start moving past anecdotes of being able to measure and showing the difference that we make. And anecdotes aren't going to cut it anymore. Now, obviously, not everyone's going to measure it. Not everyone can feel ownership. Not everyone is going to want to dive into this. But there are a lot of great efforts and a lot of ways that you can dive in. What I'm trying to do on the Washington, D.C. side is much more focused on policymakers, and guys at the White House, at the Pentagon, at the State Department, is trying to push the idea of sustainable cyberspace, trying to push the idea of getting better defense better than offense. The way to do that is to try and work at scale, to try and do things once and have them succeed a million times or billion times, and you'll see some of that coming up in this track, in this room today. Um, for example, I'm, I'm really interested in multi-compilers and things like that where you can take away entire classes of attacks that no longer succeed instead of just trying to always patch and always being behind the bad guys. I'm really trying to convince DC that they are not as much of the solution as they think they are. That there's nine players on the ball field and we don't need one general running around everywhere yelling, I got it, I got it, I got it that there are many of us that can be close to the ball and can make the play. If they're allowed to, I go. Uh, if they're allowed to, maybe they can't see the ball well enough, maybe they need a better glove, maybe they need to be reminded that they're even on the field to begin with. Um, that's how I was when I was playing baseball as a kid. Um, but, the, um, but pushing this as a private sector centric approach. That's not to saying that the private sector doesn't have its own problems. But I'm tired of always hearing in Washington, D.C. that the private sector is the problem. Last, uh, or uh, I'm trying to push hard in D.C. for a single strategy. Right now in Washington, D.C., we have three strategies for the Internet. The State Department talks all about Internet freedom. They get involved with ICANN and, and some of those issues. You've got Department of Commerce that gets involved saying good broadband strategy. You know, they own the, you know, so vaguely own the ICANN relationship, resilience, and, and they're focused in on those issues. And of course, you've got the military and the espionage. And you know what it's like. If you've got three different strategies in your life, it's tough when you have competing priorities. And our leadership in DC needs to understand that right now, whenever there's a competition between these priorities, it's been the military and the espionage priorities that tend to be winning out right now. They've got the most money, they've got, frankly, the most competence, they've got the best lawyers that are always willing to get to yes, they've got the least bureaucratic friction. So we need to change that around. Uh, I'm going to try and help write that and the tagline is going to be prosperity first and foremost um, of thinking about how can we make sure the internet is going to be there. So I do think uh, disruptive technology has a place. Um, this is a, a point I made more at Black Hat or RSA than I would here because we've got too many vendors that have a new box, a new script, a new software for a particular solution and we keep just adding complexity on top of the complexity. It's a shell game. So disruptive technologies can work but really they have to be the kind of technology that works at scale. Thank you very much. So that gives more time for shots and for um, Q&A. Um, I think probably, I don't know who's running the room. I, okay, I see. Yeah, please go up to the mic so that we can make sure we get on the video and I'll go to my right here. Oh, and if you guys are all buying me shots, please make it, try and, try and coordinate on the same kind of alcohol. It's not, okay. So the, the central question is whether or not we're asking the right question, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. defense or offense. The first thing you learn in military history is a doctrine that says anybody that does merely defense is inevitably going to lose the battle or the war. We've stuck with this for a long time because of legal issues and issues about rules of engagement, but that seems to be shifting with the cyber command in the U.S. military, yeah. starting to attack some of the uh, nation state based uh, APT uh, yeah. teams. So 
I think that the entire uh, formula changes once you start going on offense yourself because now you can yeah. disrupt the offense yeah. that's attacking you. Yeah. And you can also, uh, to use a, an example from military history, do what China always did. Don't try to stop them at the perimeter. Let them come in. Let them yeah. exhaust their own resources trying to yeah. take over. Uh, so there's all kinds okay. of ways to create uh, obfuscation yeah. and resource exhaustion in defense. Um, certainly the, we want to change the work factor between the offense and the defense. We want to raise the work factor. And one way that you can raise their work factor is to try and disrupt them. And I'm a big, f I'm a fan of that when I'm in my moments that says an armed society is a polite society but I'm not convinced that we get at scale defense better than offense by attacking back. Um, defense doesn't have to be hard, we just suck at it. And one of the reasons now why the Department of Defense is being more offensively minded is they can't defend their own systems as well as they like. And so I am not a fan of saying as, a, as an enterprise, an individual corporate enterprise, or as a armed military with uniformed people um, with an American flag patch on their shoulder saying that we should go ahead and do disruptive attacks because we're not very good at defense. It has a role. I'm a cyber conflict, cyber warfare kind of guy. Cyber, cyber, cyber. <laughs> um, so it's got a role but we're defaulting to it because we suck at defense. And, and, and that pisses me off. I, 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 okay. We got to go back and forth. Right. Oh, we can, you can find me afterwards. Yeah, and let's go on my left side here. So for the technologies that we should be developing to help out with this, do you have any particular recommendations? Are we thinking like large scale mix, mix next works in order to anonymize or should we be looking at um, very sophisticated, intelligent, automated analysis of code before something even gets deployed to remove vulnerabilities? What do you feel is the best way forward that we can help develop? Yeah, the, uh, it's a great question and um, some of you guys that are closer to the, to the technology than, than I've gotten. Um, in DC can have better answers, but the kinds of things that we can take off entire classes of attacks, and I'm not convinced we have to do deep packet inspection for that. If the world's internet, if the world's ISPs were run as cleanly as say Scandinavian ISPs, we would have a lot less problems. Oh man, spotlight on you, look at that. Um, the, we would have a lot fewer problems. So I'm really interested in metacompilers. I'm really interested in um, we've got a couple other talks that are going to be in this track that are really hitting that. I think focusing on ISPs, it doesn't even necessarily have to be technology. It's just ownership and a willingness or responsibility to no longer pass the trash. So it's not crazy in Washington DC to talk about zero nuclear weapons even though we can never get there. I'd love to set goals of saying good, let's get ourselves to zero botnets. You know, we can do it. I mean if we said everybody come to the table and we're going to try and get botnets out, out, uh, out of the system, we could do it if we wanted to. So actually I'm very curious, he, one of the reasons I'm here is to find out what are some of these other attacks that will, that, I'm sorry, attacks that we can just take out, entire classes of attacks, you know, whether it's buffer overflows or race control, I mean let's just take this stuff out. If you're interested then, in getting to a private sector solution, how do you incentivize the public to be willing to pay for <coughs> sort of Security okay. over functionality. Yeah, um, good to see it. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, one is to look that we've got different parts of private sector. Washington DC tends to paint it, oh, it's all private sector. And there's a couple things that I would do. One, I would want the Department of Homeland Security to set up a program of grants. You could take $10 million to look at groups like um, open source vulnerability database that Jericho is doing, NSPSEC, you know, these groups that are actually on the ball field and making the plays and they're making do with, you know, $10,000 a year. Um, so one, let's find out who's playing on the field, who's close to the ball, help them out. Two, this is more of an answer for Black Hat than for here, if I were DHS in the White House, I would be going and convincing Warren Buffett and institutional shareholders like CalPERS. Um, these people that are shareholders in the companies that are making these bad risk decisions. We still see Washington DC say, oh, we have to go convince these system administrators or these chief information security officers to do the right thing. Screw that. In American style capitalism, it's the shareholders at the end of the day that are holding the risk because they own the company. The board directors are representing them. So I say don't let the government try and convince these board directors. Go to the shareholders. Before Y2K, CalPERS, the California Retire Pension Retirement System, 250 billion, went to all of their companies and said, 
um, how are you getting ready for Y2K? Let's get them to do that. Let's get Warren Buffett out there and say, I'm never going to invest in a company unless I know that they're getting cybersecurity right. So we've got a couple other ideas that we can incentivize using the processes. And we've got some other ideas we can talk about later. Jay, thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Hi. Um, earlier you said that when you tell the military to obey the laws of the United States, it's seen mm -hmm. as muling. Um, and in your response right there, you just said that the shareholders of a corporation should hold the directors responsible and do what they do. Yeah. So what good is all of your policy and talking if the United States military will not obey the laws that exist? Yeah. Aren't, uh, your, aren't your words just weak? Aren't, your, aren't you just I'm you not know, saying we're creating coming a lot from of dust and of, of nothing if, if Clapper and Alexander lie to Congress, lie to the court, and lie to us? I mean, shouldn't we start with accountability at the top instead of, you know, just creating a bunch of uh, tracks in the desert? <laughs> the, it's a mix. I'm not saying, I mean, all of us, from whatever angle we're trying to take this, have the deck stacked against us. So I'm not saying I'm coming in with the strongest argument. I'm coming with an argument that, has more, that is more likely to win in Washington, D.C. So I came out... Um, well, probably a year ago now, and said, General Alexander should be forced to retire early. We need in to jail. separate NSA, the le at least the leadership of NSA and Cyber Command. Um, as a start, um, we've got to start from that. Um, and it ended up that we, you know, the president made other decisions on that. But when I came out with that piece, I had people all over Washington, D.C. saying, you can't use my name with this, but good job. Don't tell anyone I said this. So there is a groundswell of folks that say we have been going in this direction and it's not necessarily the right direction. Um, folks that say, I've talked to four-star generals that have said how we got where we are was like a French pointillist painter, like George Surratt, you know, the guys that make the little dots on the canvas. And, um, and we never stepped back to look at the painting that we were actually making and especially the way others saw it. So I'm not saying we're going to have an easy time, but there's a lot of folks that believe the way that I do um, in Washington, D.C., that think we're badly off track. And so part of my job, and frankly part of the Dark Tangent's job, he's, he's a senior fellow associated with my program, um, and we're out trying to help make this case. So we'll try, and we'll tell you next year how we're doing. Alexander and Clapper should be in jail. Generalization, but how do we take the example of Switzerland as a nation state using defense greater than offense in history huh. and huh. cure the apathy and ignorance of the average person, not just DEF CON attendees, to use that model uh, to become a cleaner and better internet? Yeah, no, I really like that. I, that hadn't come up before. Um, Switzerland has made themselves undevourable. Um, I mean, great chocolate, but, um, you know... But, it, but it's, it's what we're getting at. I love this section. You guys are like my, you're laughing at every damn joke. The, um, they're absolutely, you know, between a mixture of terrain, doctrine, weaponry of saying we are too difficult to target. Now, individual companies have been able to do that in the internet of saying we're too tough, just look somewhere else, you're not going to get in here. That doesn't work quite so well as it, as it used to. I love that as a model. So how can we take that redoubt and see if we can make that work at scale. It's, yeah, it seems like a combination of apathy and ignorance, right? <laughs> and, and you've got to right. cure both. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's a, a saying that if a predator is too successful in the short term, he's going to starve to death in the long That's term. Really interesting. Um, I'm wondering whether that concept has been part of your research when uh, you're uh, evaluating what the tipping point is going to be. Is there really going to be a a tipping point or after a certain point, is, is it just going to come into equilibrium? Yeah, I think the resource depletion, I mean, because that's what happens, the predators um, get too voracious, there's resource depletion and it affects the entire ecosystem. Unfortunately, we're the ecosystem, right? Um, so what I, that's what I'm worried about at the end of the day, isn't that they're gonna exhaust each other, but they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna eat our servers out of existence. And I was talking to, to one of the four-star generals and they said, Jay, I get it. I understand that when I'm in, if I'm fighting 
a naval battle or an air battle, I'm not going to have civilian ships or civilian aircraft sail th or fly through my battle zone. I get this is different. And I always say to them, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's the wrong analogy. You are sailing or flying through an internet that we built, that companies built using their own money, right? They're not sailing or flying through your battlefield. You're sailing in our, you know, in the sea that we built. Um, and, and that's what's going to get that resource depletion. But, but it's a great example and I'd, uh, and I'd be interested in thinking some more about that, you know, and, and what that might look like. Um, go to my right here and I... So here at DEF CON, mm -hmm. you have an army willing and able to implement technical solutions to this problem. But on the societal and political fronts, what does the army look like? Are they weak? Are they strong? Is there a strategy? There's not a strategy yet. Um, that's part of what I'm trying to bring together. That's part of what the Dark Tangent's trying to bring together. Um, you know, when he talks about why he spends time in D.C., he says he's trying to social, social engineer Washington, D.C. You know, kind of learn their ways so that he, he can manipulate them. Um, so you've got a lot of folks, some at the White House, some at the Department of Homeland Security, um, and other places. Um, and so it's starting to come together. Um, but I think it's still, it's still not an army yet. Um, and the more that we can hear the voices from the community, like for example, in Germany you've got the Chaos Computer Club, I was just being told the other day, you know, has a much stronger role. Um, in other countries, uh, some of the companies have, have the role in governance and, and we're not going to get that there. So is a technical solution enough? Oh God, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think we can invent our way out of this because the government, governments, all governments, and, I, and I'm sorry guys, I'm not gonna be able to get to you. We're, I just got the one minute, I'll, I'll be around afterwards. Um, the coercive power of governments right now is winning. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not saying, by the way, governments are the only threat. Um, they are amongst the threats that we're facing. Um, but the coercive power of governments is showing itself again and again to be superior here. Um, and it isn't just in this field. If you look, for example, across the Arab Spring, if you look across all the revolutions, um, it was people spouting liber liberty and freedom and force cannot bring us down and nothing was ever won with a bayonet. And now they're finding in Egypt and in Libya and so many other places that no, the bayonet does sometimes have the last say. Um, so we as a community can't just sit back and say, well, you know, our free speech is gonna win out in the end, because it's not necessarily. The government has a lot of coercive powers. China and other governments have way more coercive powers. So I don't think we're going to be able to invent our way out of this. Thank you very much.